I want to wish you all a most blessed and joyous Easter. And I want to tell you how much I miss being with you in person. Our normal Sunday worship is the highlight of my week, certainly vocationally. It's also the culmination of all that we share as a Christian community. Until now, frankly, I have resisted communicating with you by streaming or uh, by recorded message, because I find most online worship not all that engaging. However, it is Easter, and I'm grateful to be able to communicate with you the good news of the gospel in any way that's possible. It's also true that the good news is never more needed than it is at a time like the present. I'm going to begin by reading to you from the gospel according to John, which is one of the gospels appointed for this Easter feast. We have an option between John and Matthew, but I'm uh, choosing to read from John. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, this comes from the 20th chapter. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away. So she ran and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple and uh, told them, we do not know what's happened. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrap, uh, wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping, outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. O God, who made this holy day shine with the glory of the Lord's resurrection, Stir up in your church that spirit of adoption which is given to us in baptism 
that we, being renewed both in body and mind, may worship you in sincerity and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. One of the remarkable things about this day, this most holy of days, is that it celebrates a God who is absent. The disciples came looking, but the tomb was empty. There are many details of the Easter tradition that vary from one gospel account to another, but on one point they all agree. There was a tomb and it was empty. In Jewish culture, it was the work of women to prepare a body for burial. And since this wasn't permitted on the Sabbath, Saturday, early Sunday morning after the Sabbath, the female disciples of Jesus came to the tomb, having procured the necessary items for burial. John's version of the story has Mary Magdalene be the first who discovers the empty tomb. She then runs, as you just heard, she runs to find Peter, and I think it was John, and tells them, as we have just heard, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. It is at this point that the story gets really interesting, because each storyteller gives his own version of what comes next. And this depends on the particular concerns of each writer, concerns formed by issues facing the local communities in which they were writing, as well as larger issues that were influencing life in Palestine when each of them was writing. And of course, in a world of limited communications and transportation, each account was influenced by which stories about the resurrection were circulating in their geographical area at that time. If we are to allow the resurrection to support us in developing a vital faith, it won't be by seizing on one of these stories to the exclusion of all the others that we will have success with this. Rather, it will be in celebrating, or better yet, in immersing ourselves in the diverse answers the gospel gives to the question that the gospels give to the question of where the empty tomb leads. As one writer has observed, it is in the finding, not in the seeking, that religion goes awry. Empty tombs foster faith, not certainty. Empty tombs do not mark the end of the chase, only the beginning. An empty tomb invites us to compassion, compassion born of empathy for those who are uncertain and still looking. An empty tomb proclaims that God is moving on. It is Easter. Hunt God, says this writer, as well as eggs. Eggs you may find, but pray for your sake and for the sake of the world that God will continue to elude you. People are, who are still looking for God do not ostracize minorities or declare war on people of other cultures and religions or blow themselves up for Allah. Quite possibly, the most beautiful and the most poignant post-empty tomb encounter in the Gospels is the one found in John. There, after returning to the tomb with Peter and John, Mary Magdalene stands outside weeping, wondering what has been done with Jesus' body. While this is taking place, she turns around and sees Jesus standing there. But John tells us that she does not know who it is. In fact, she assumes it's the gardener. 
And she asks him where he has put the body. This encounter is certainly not about certainty. Otherwise, Mary would never have mistaken Jesus for the gardener. It is essentially about the mystery of God becoming alive to us when in the fullest sense of the word, we recognize one another and see the face of Jesus in each. This is an affirmation of our most fundamental relationship with God, who going all the way back to the prophet Isaiah said, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name you are mine. In a culture like ours, where even people we've never met address us by our first names, as if we were intimate friends, it's difficult to comprehend the importance associated with names in ancient Palestinian society. There, the speaking of a person's name was believed to make the essence, the soul of that person, available to the speaker. So when Jesus, unrecognized by Mary, simply calls her by name, suddenly everything changes. Immediately, in response to this one word, Mary, she recognizes him and says, Rabuni, teacher, thus completing the connection between the two. And this is not all. <clears throat> it appears that Mary responds to what has transpired by embracing Jesus. Maybe she was grabbing hold of his feet. Matthew talks about uh, the women grabbing hold of Jesus' feet so that he would not escape. For then he says, paradoxically, do not hold on to me. And it's significant that he does not say, get away from me or don't touch me. But he says, do not hold on to me. It's not about distance. Uh, it's about uh, inhibiting me. It's a perfect follow-up to the empty tomb. For here is another reminder that no matter how much we want to find the one answer that will end our search, we cannot capture God. We cannot hold on to Jesus. We cannot domesticate him without putting him back in the tomb. Instead, we are invited to seek and to follow him, a quest which, if we take it, will never make us comfortable for very long, <clears throat> excuse me, but it will provide us with a lifetime of excitement and will repeatedly reveal to us a fresh Christ who will surprise us again and again with new life. <clears throat> this seeking after Christ is more than a mental exercise, for he calls us to follow him out there into the world, where we will discover him working with at-risk children in the communities that surround us, feeding the hungry through Christian neighbors, working to strengthen families and to assuage loneliness in our own community, ministering to those stricken with the coronavirus and to their anxious families, attempting to alleviate poverty and violence and weeping with refugee children who are not being called by name by government officials. He is out there, always on the move, inviting us to join him wherever people hunger for compassion and justice. As Teresa of Avila said 500 years ago, Christ has no hands but ours, no feet but ours. We bear him to humanity. We bring him forth to his world like Mary, his mother, did. Without us, he can do nothing. That is how he chooses for it to be. Amen.